Bruce, you must have something really good too. Of course I do, it's Bruce Danielson, and I guess I'm here to entertain you too. Good afternoon. I call to order the informational meeting of January 19th, 2021. Welcome to those here in person, those watching online or on television. Since we have some on the phone, we're gonna start with the roll call of our city council. Council members Brecky. Erickson. Jensen. Here. Kylie. Neitzert. Here. Selberg. Here. Sale. Here. Star. Here. Very good. We have, looks like three absent at this point. We may have some join. Kylie's here. Oh, thank you, Councillor Kylie. So right now we have uh, Councillor Brecky absent, and I know Councillor Erickson is out of town right now. So we will move on to our first order of business, committee and commission reports. First up is item A, Siouxland Heritage Museum Board. Councillor Starr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, with all the things that happened in 2020, the Siouxland Heritage Museum uh, finished the year in the black, and the city of Sioux Falls will be receiving a refund uh, that we spent less, the, the, Her the museum board spent less than uh, was allocated for the year. So with good management and some uh, couple events that happened that uh, we weren't counting on, uh, the, the uh, system is uh, definitely in the black. Uh, the other, I think, an exciting thing as part of the museum board is that we're looking at doing a every other month meeting um, as the number of issues that face that board now with the uh, uh, new building coming on board, the Re Irene Hall uh, Resource Center coming on board, we're able to uh, cover most of what we need every other month. So um, with that, it was kind of a, this last meeting was about wrapping up uh, 2020 and definitely like everyone else looking forward to 2021. Very good, thank, thank you. you. Uh, before we move on to our next report, I heard somebody come on. Was that you, Councillor Brecky? It was. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to our next report, item B, Municipal Band Task Force. Councillor Jensen. Mr. Chair, thanks. We uh, had our uh, final meeting of the task force last Thursday, and uh, we had a subgroup that looked into uh, starting the negotiation process with the Washington Pavilion or at least seeing if they could manage uh, the band a little better than, than it has been uh, to date. Uh, Director Hill was a part of that, Mr. Hallbeck and uh, Mrs. Gullickson were all a part of that meeting with um, the Washington Pavilion and Alex Hallbeck brought a, a motion to enter into negotiations uh, with the administration and the uh, pavilion to manage that piece for us. So that's what they're gonna start to do. We're gonna give a formal uh, report to the city council in the uh, near future, but uh, we have, I think, found a really good home for the municipal ban and for its sustainability. I think it's a really good thing. So I'm glad that Councilor uh, Sale got us in motion, uh, funded the ban this, this year and I think we're gonna do some good things. So thank you, sir, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Excellent work, glad to hear it. Next up is item C, Urbanized Development Commission. I'm going to give that report. We had a meeting last week. Uh, we covered a handful of housekeeping items. There are two major items I think that are worthy of note for, for the benefit of everyone, which was the completion of the environmental studies and interchange uh, reports for I-229 in Minnesota Avenue interchange and the Cliff Avenue interchange. They're both scheduled for reconstruct and reconfiguration in the coming years. After completing the studies for Minnesota Avenue, the preferred alternative is 9D and essentially the major changes you will see is that as you exit off I-229 westbound, the stoplight would be aligned with 49th Street and then there, how you're gonna come on and come off is gonna be a little bit different. And then for Cliff Avenue, the preferred alternative is item is six, and it involves realigning the current 41st Street to be farther north. Actually, it's gonna, it looks like it would essentially align with 
kind of the south entrance into Lincoln High School, and there'd be a stoplight there, and then there'd be more distance between 41st Street and the interchange, which right now those two are very close to each other, and it makes for some awkward turning movements. Uh, both are scheduled for construction in about 2024 to 2026, and in both cases, they are exploring uh, potentially if they could do some sort of a, an underground tunnel or something to that effect that would get you from the north to the south, particularly with Cliff Avenue to get to the bike trail. That may not be feasible based on uh, uh, water and, and, and just simply cost, but anything they can do to make it more multimodal and more pedestrian friendly. Now they are looking at doing side paths, I believe in both cases, which we've had a lot of success with. So at the very least that would help. But one of the big things for the bike committee is that they'd love a way for people to be able to get from the north side of Cliff Avenue to the bike trail because it's, it's very difficult. So um, that is moving forward and that is the report of UDC. So next up is council remarks. Anyone with any council remarks today? On the phones? Hearing none, we're gonna move on to presentations. We have two presentations today, both of which I'm incredibly excited for. The first is the Hayward Park Master Plan Update that is presented by, uh, it looks like we have Mike Patton here from Parks and Rec, and we also have Director Don Kearney in the audience. Welcome. Thank you, counselors. Uh, Mike Patton with uh, Parks and Recreation, and here today to give you an update on a project we've been working on now for a while, which is updating the Park Master Plan at Hayward Park. So first off, I'd like to give you kind of a brief overview of the master planning process and the various steps we went through in developing the new master plan. Also, I'd like to talk about how uh, park development happens typically and, and could happen in this project. Uh, introduce you to a couple of people here behind me as far as potential partnerships, and then we can try and address any qu questions you might have. So this project uh, was about an eight month process to develop the new master plan. And it really involved kind of four key steps. Uh, first of all, we do an inventory and analysis, which is really uh, an in-depth investigation into the park site itself, as well as the neighborhood, where we try to identify, you know, potential issues and opportunities that might exist uh, for the park. Uh, we also do a pretty in-depth information gathering piece, which in this process involved um, a couple of different online surveys, one put out by our department, one put out by the Hayward School District, uh, really just to get information from the students and the users of the park, as well as the parents uh, that bring them there. And uh, in addition to those surveys, we also polled some of the users of the community center and the playground park program that happened there in the park. We held um, a couple different public meetings with the neighborhood and um, also did an in-depth research into the demographics for the Hayward neighborhood, just to kind of give us um, a, an idea of what are the needs uh, for that neighborhood and how could they uh, be served by the park. And so what we do is combine those two processes, put together what I'm calling our key takeaways, which is information we utilize uh, to really help inform the design process and which is ultimately becomes the new master plan for the park. So what were those key takeaways? Uh, first off, uh, the existing park features uh, are dated. They've served their useful life, and it's probably time for replacement or renovation of those. Uh, we also found that most of the features in the park are pretty disconnected. Typically, a good park plan will uh, locate certain elements together so they flow well and the space can be maximized. Most of the elements in this park were kind of scattered throughout. It didn't have uh, real great connections or flow throughout the park. Uh, there was a concern about visibility and safety in the park that was noted over and over in our surveys. Um, there is street lighting around the perimeter, but uh, there's really only one park light in there, and, and that was a concern that was noted. Most of the people we spoke with were really interested in creating some new experiences in the park. Uh, one, one item of note for Hayward Park is that it is a school site and the school itself provides um, a couple different um, play equipment pieces. 
Uh, one is a five through 12, which is your standard play you find in most parks, but they also have a smaller tot lot piece. And so what that does is sort of affords us the opportunity to maybe create something unique uh, because that typical play use is already located there in the park. Uh, one piece that came up and it came up over and over is a lack of access to water-based recreation. Now this park and neighborhood is served by the Keene Park Pool, but I can tell you it's a pretty difficult route to get there if you don't own a car. It's about a mile away, but it's about an hour and a half trek. And that involves the crossing of multiple barriers like arterial streets and railroad tracks and steep terrain and rivers. And it's, a, it's just a very difficult route to get from this neighborhood to a swimming pool. So uh, you'll see when we go over the master plan why we located a certain element in the park. And then really we found, uh, we really think this master plan needs to be set up to create a sense of community for this neighborhood, give them a sense of pride and a place to gather and form relationships. On the screen you'll see is the proposed master plan. Uh, one of the items, sort of the key signature element in the park is a spray pad. Now the spray pad would be similar to what's located at Pioneer Park in scale. It doesn't you know, provide swimming, but it does provide um, a form of water-based recreation and they're very, very popular. And in this particular case, we feel like it can be a bridge in that gap between a pool in every neighborhood and, and still offering some form of water-based recreational access. It'll also require certain support facilities to go along it, like a restroom and shade, as well as connections to all the different pieces throughout the park. We're also uh, proposing to um, update the play equipment with something unique and locate it closer to the school's play equipment, which is located on the right side of the page as you're looking at it near the uh, playground of the school. And we also located a, a large walking loop throughout the center of the park, and it's something we find is very simple, but it's also um, really, really popular in all our parks. It's just a loop to walk in. It's not sidewalk, it's not on the street. It gives you a dedicated space simply for walking and they're very, very popular. And the nice thing about them is in addition to creating that walking space, it can also be utilized as a connection spine to all the different elements throughout the park. We're also proposing to increase signage, create some trees. We located a proposed dog park on the eastern side of the park. One thing we found in our research of the demographics is this neighborhood has a very, very high population of dogs per residence, and it also has probably the lowest green space per residence in the, in the town. So uh, offering the opportunity, one, to give a space for dogs to run off leash would be advantageous for this neighborhood, but also we found that dog parks are really more for the owners and less about the dogs, and what they do is they provide a space for people to gather, be friends, communicate, and enjoy each other. And finally, we've shown expansion of the uh, community gardens there on the bottom of the page. Right now, there is some gardens that are sort of raised uh, planting beds in the park, and they're primarily used for uh, educational pieces with the school. And the idea is to pop possibly expand upon that into an area where uh, the neighborhood could grow food for themselves and actually use kind of a farm-to-table approach as um, food isn't the most access accessible in this neighborhood. Give you an idea of what some of those pieces may look like. You can see we show a spray park in the top there. Maybe some unique play features like a gravity rail or, uh, you know, an obstacle course. Expanding those community gardens and, of course, the off-leash dog park. So the park development process always begins with updating the master plan, which we've done here. And the park board approved this in December of 2020. Next steps would be involved... Uh, you know, programming it into our capital plan, identifying those funding opportunities and investigating potential partnerships, which we'll get into here in a second. Next step would be the design and bid the project, which is typically a three to six month process, depending on the complexity of the project. And then construction, um, ideally um, in a situation like this would be bid early in the year and construct throughout the summer and complete by fall. We did do some cost estimates on this just to see what the potential 
uh, cost impacts will be for the development. We're estimating approximately one and a half million is what the splash pad costs with the support facilities. Around 400,000 to improve the play areas like the dog park and the new play equipment. And then the walking loop and the connections and grading and irrigation, all that goes with that is around a quarter million dollars for a total project of about 2.2 million. So with that, I'm gonna introduce you to Steve Hildebrand with Promising Futures and Matt Paulson with Leadership Sioux Falls. And they're gonna talk a little bit about uh, their organization and potential desire to partner on this project. Great. Welcome, Matt. Yeah, good afternoon, City Council. Uh, Matt Paulson here. So I am part of the 35th class of Leadership Sioux Falls. Uh, also here with me is Dan Kipley and James Gasper. They're also in a class. So for anyone not familiar, Leadership Sioux Falls is a class put on by the Chamber of Commerce every year for kind of up and coming leaders in our community, about 30, 40 people in it every year. Uh, one of the requirements of Leadership Sioux Falls is to do a community service project. They've been doing that for the last few years now. And we really wanted to do something that has a lasting impact on our community. Uh, some of the past classes have done um, like workshops and stuff like that. And we wanted to kind of leave a permanent mark on the city. And we were made aware of this project by uh, Steve Hildebrand from the Promising Futures Fund. Uh, Steve is gonna do kind of a parallel fundraising effort um, alongside ours. Um, but you know, I've worked with Steve on a few projects. He made us aware of this project. It seems like a good um, opportunity for our Leadership Sioux Falls. Um, our kind of group has um, determined that we would like to raise $100,000 for this project. And the idea is that money would go to fund the playground equipment in a park, which is you know, kind of about that amount of money. Um, you know, not look, really looking for a bunch of recognition, maybe a plaque, no, really not anything more than that. Um, the or Sioux Falls Area Community Foundation, they've agreed to kind of be the kind of intermediary in between the city and um, the donors that we attract. Um, so they have agreed to set up a fund, or they will by the end of the month anyway. It's, I think they have to have a meeting in a week or two. Um, but they're gonna set up a fund. Um, Steve's going to, you know, direct money towards that fund. Um, we are as well, and uh, you know, hopefully we will come to you with a $100,000 check um, in a couple months, and hopefully we can put some playground equipment in Hayward Park. And I'll let Steve go, and then I think we're happy to answer any questions that might come up. Thank you very much, Matt. Welcome, Steve. Glad to have you here. City Council members, thank you for having me. Steve Hildebrand. I'm the chair of the Promising Futures Fund. We... Uh, our newer organization, we started about a year and a half ago here in Sioux Falls. Uh, we represent, I don't know if we represent, but we assist uh, 14 schools here in Sioux Falls, 12 elementary schools and two middle schools, um, all with the highest rates of poverty. And that's kind of our focus. Hayward Elementary is a major focus of ours. Um, the school has about 80% of the students who qualify for federal poverty assistance. And it's, a, it's an important marker for us to get involved with that school at that time. Derek Mawson is the principal um, of the school. He's here today. Um, he and, and Jeff Sheets, who was principal right prior to uh, this, are the ones who put this in our um, lap and said, we need help. We need a park that our school can be proud of, that our neighborhood can be proud of, and that Sioux Falls at large can be proud of. And Sioux Falls is a phenomenal place to be because we have a park system that pales in comparison to so many others. It's a great system, it's, it's expansive, and it's well utilized by our community. We wanna thank Don Kearney and Mike Patton and their team at Parks for really taking this um, by the lead and, and Facilitating a process that was inclusive, uh, that really brought in input from the school and from the, from the neighborhood. Um, they really looked at this existing park and said, we can do better. And that's what this is all about today. I grew up in Mitchell, across the street from a, a neighborhood park just like this. It was a lower income neighborhood. And I can't tell you what it meant to my family to have a park that we could play in, meet other kids in, meet other neighbors in, and you know have that be part of our community experience. This is gonna transform this neighborhood. 
If you're not all familiar with the Hayward neighborhood, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trailer houses. It's a mobile home park. Not exclusively, but in large part, that's what the neighborhood is made up of. In most of these courts, they don't have much for a yard. They don't have sidewalks for the most part. And so for kids to play safely, they need a park they can go to. For families to have a place to exercise and to be part of a community, they need a park to go to. For dogs that exist in these trailer parks at higher levels than other places, they need a place for exercise. And as Mike said, this is a place for those dog owners to meet their neighbors. And that's the way we've experienced dog parks ourselves. This is transformational. This is, this is really big. And I'm glad, Councilmember Knight, sir, that you're as excited as you are about this, because this is, we need the leadership in this city to, to make this park really great for this neighborhood. Um, our board is very committed to making this um, possible. And uh, we appreciate the partnership with, with Leadership Sioux Falls. That's, that's really important. But we're also committed to at least $100,000 to put into this effort um, that we will raise in this community. We hope to raise in this community, but I expect we will because Sioux Falls is so giving. And I hope we will do better than that, to be honest with you. Not that it's essential that private money comes to a city park, but our foundation recognized at the very beginnings of, of our efforts that this is a park that needed improvements because it was underutilized. And it's a very underserved neighborhood. You know, we're a couple blocks away from the new banquet facility, and that in itself should tell you how underserved this neighborhood is. So we appreciate uh, you taking a hard look at this. We, we hope and, and, and expect to gain support for this because this is going to be a great thing for Sioux Falls. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So with that, I can try and answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe before we do that, I did have a chance to meet with uh, Principal Derek Mawson today in his office, and uh, if there's no objections, I wouldn't mind if, if maybe he stepped forward, if he'd be willing, and just told us what it would, what this project would mean for the children and, and for the um, families in the community, because we had a really good discussion about that today. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Councilman Knight, sir. Um, the Hayward Park would be a welcome asset to to that area and to families. They like has been said over and over again by Mr. Patton. Um, they need a place to come together, and this is it. It would build a sense of community. It would give them something to be uh, immensely proud of, and I, I truly believe they would treat it very well. Um, we had an addition to our playground actually this summer through a cycle that the Sioux Falls School District goes through, and they purchase new playground equipment every 15, 20 years, I think, is on the cycle. And it was our turn this summer, and uh, I was very alarmed when that, just a quick anecdote, I was very alarmed when that playground equipment arrived. It was in boxes, and it just laid out on the playground in smaller boxes for many nights. And uh, I would drive around just anxiously waiting for a call that it was gone, and it never left. They knew that was their playground equipment. They knew that that was theirs, and uh, it never left. And since that playground equipment has stood beautifully. Um, it, again, they just... They crave, this neighborhood craves and needs something that uh, they will rally around and be proud of, and I think Hayward Park is a great starting point. Thank you. Great. Thank you for coming today. With, with that, I'm going to open it up to questions, either for park staff or any, any of the private individuals. Councilor Sale. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm all for this project and, and very supportive of it, and I know it's needed. Here's my question on the cost estimates. Pa splash pad area, $1.55 million for just basic concrete with some pipes underneath it that will spray it. To me, I'm, I will say I'm constantly shocked at the price of construction and the projects that come before the city. So my question, where did you, where did you come up with these estimates? And can't we get... Can't we get somebody to donate the concrete and some plastic pipe and away we go? Well, there is a little bit more to it than some concrete and plastic pipe. But uh, we work with, uh, you know, lots of different vendors. 
and a lot of the playground manufacturers and splash pad and pool manufacturers uh, on a regular basis, whether they're updating our existing or, or we're looking at new. And to do a, a, a spray park really can range from just like an interactive fountain to Disneyland and kind of everywhere in between. And so to do a spray park about the size of what Hayward is, which is wildly popular for that neighborhood, the range is in that 1.4 to 1.6 million, uh, which is a very costly amount, but that's, that's what we'd expect to see if we built it. So to follow up on that a little bit, what kind of square footage are you talking about? And based on your picture that you put in here, I mean, it looks about like there's might be 40 kids in there. How many kids can you put in this spray park? Well, I'd, I'd have to get back to you with the square footage. I don't know that off of the top of my head, but um, let, let me get those numbers and get back to you with that. Okay, thank you. Others with questions? Mr. Chair? Yes, Councilor Kiley. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, uh, I, I really want to thank Promising Futures, uh, Leadership Sioux Falls. So thank you, Steve and Matt. And a special thanks to Jan Nikolai, my former principal at Washington High School, who invited me to become a part of this process. And quite frankly, it's hard to remember if that was uh, earlier uh, in 2020 or actually prior to that, but I know that this has been in the works for a while. I also want to thank uh, Principal Mawson with the Sioux Falls School District and uh, Sioux Falls Parks, uh, Director Kearney and uh, Mike Patton. This wasn't even really on the radar, and if you, if you look, at not even in the five-year plan, and I had questioned that when we went through budget budget hearings, and uh, now it's poised to become a reality. And why is that? It, it's because of the public-private relationship that we have developed. And yes, Councilor Sale, maybe we'll even get somebody to donate the concrete for the splash pad. We can always hope. But there is a dire need in this location. As Steve had mentioned, this is a location with hundreds and hundreds of, of mobile homes, individuals, that certainly are in need of uh, better amenities uh, when it comes to parks. And you've heard me speak most recently when we were discussing the house at, at Tud Hill. I'm, I'm in support of that. However, I'm in support in bringing equity across the city before we really invest, even in projects such as the Tud Hill Park. So hopefully we can get develop that public-private relationship there as well, but the parks serve such an important role. Like Steve, I grew up in a neighborhood uh, where uh, the park, in my case, Dan Dugan Park in Sioux Falls, at that time was Southern Sioux Falls, now it's pretty much central, played uh, an enormous role in, in my life and provided me with a place to go, a safe place to go and, and with activities directed by park personnel. And that's what I'm looking forward to bringing to the, the children in the Hayward area, as well as their parents, too. Um, the nearest water activity, uh, it's too far for them, really, too dangerous for them to even ride a bicycle there to get all the way down uh, from the northwest down to uh, Keene Park. So all in favor of bringing, at the minimum, the, spat, uh, the splash pad. And I think, uh, as Steve mentioned, too, the dog park is a great, would be a great asset to this area because there is a higher than normal level of dog ownership in this particular part of town. So what a great way to get out and to meet your neighbors, too. So I'm all in favor of this. Again, I want to thank everybody involved. It's only through your involvement that, uh, this is moving at the rate that it is. So uh, I'm very much in support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Kiley. Others on the phones? Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Uh, it Mr. sounds Chair. like it was Councillor Selberg, and then we'll go to Brecky. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'd reiterate what's been said a lot by Councillor Kiley. Thank you to those who've gotten involved. Uh, a number of years ago, when we first moved to Sioux Falls, we were on the south or the northwest part of town, 
And so we're very familiar with that area. My daughters both went to Hayward. And, boy, is it ever needed. Um, Keene Park is, is not even an option. So um, I think it'll be a terrific addition. Um, I think Councillor Sale had a good point. I mean, sometimes you see costs of things, and, of course, nowadays everything's crazy. You always wonder if you can't shave some bucks off here or there. I'd be interested to hear some notions, again, if there are donations that can help in that route. But, boy, I can't think of a better project in a more needed area and can't thank the people behind this enough because, uh, again, from firsthand experience and having my girls grow up in that area for a few years, um, it, it's just so needed and will do so much good. So thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Brecky. Thank you. I had a couple questions about the spray park as well. Can you just reiterate for me the discussions around the water feature and how you determined to have the spray park and how much more would it cost to have something, um, I guess, it sounds to me like a, a, the spray park was sort of a second choice. And, you know, I just was wondering, is, is expensive it is, is it that it is, um, how, how, um, how did you consider something even more comprehensive and how much more would it cost to make something even more spectacular out there? Okay, uh, Mike Patton here. Councilor Brecky. Uh, to answer that question, I would say uh, really the sky's the limit. You could go anywhere from something very, very small to something very, very large. And we felt that um, the size spray pad that we put in the master plan fits both that need that we've seen in the neighborhood and it kind of simulates uh, sort of the hydrant parties that happen out there, which are wildly popular and really exciting for the whole neighborhood. And, and it's also uh, in scale with the park as well as the community. So we felt that was, was uh, the appropriate fit for that. Uh, one thing I want to point out, and I feel a little sim uh, silly for not mentioning it when Councillor Sale asked about the price tag on it, uh, that price does include the restroom and the support facilities, like the pump house and the mechanical equipment that goes with it. So it's not, 1.5 million wasn't just the spray pad, it's kind of that whole area. And so there, you know, restroom and all those shade structures that go with it is a piece of that price as well. So. So just one further follow-up question. Um, how do you determine, like, for example, when you build what you did at Terrace Park and what you, know, what you did at Drake Springs, how do you determine where, where you put those as opposed to, again, a smaller version of the spray pad here? Is the reason we're only doing the spray pad here is because Keene Park is close, but it's just not... Um, it, from a terrain standpoint, apparently, it just it doesn't it, it's not as accessible as it should be. So you're really trying to serve a smaller area, and what would be the downside of trying to serve a larger, you know, I could try I guess encourage a larger participation by putting something more elaborate in there. Well, the location of our pools and aquatic facilities, and the scale of those are really outlined in our. The aquatic facilities master plan which is a piece of our system master plan and we look at that through more of a comprehensive look at the whole city not so much individual neighborhood needs per se because uh, not just the capital expense but the operational impact to having a pool for every single uh, neighborhood would be uh, just unrealistic uh, as far as if there's an appetite to do a larger uh, water feature in this particular uh, park, we'd have to look into that from both a capital standpoint, fit for that staffing and operational impact. I, I guess you, you've pretty much answered the question, and I, I, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse, but I did want to. So, this northwest area, because I'm circling back that it doesn't have a large facility, right? We just have the two smaller facilities up there, or, or will have. We only have Keen, Keen Pool, and then and this will just be another smaller facility. Right, and at the, at the time of the Aquatic Facilities Master Plan update, which was just approved last December, uh, now maybe last January, uh, the need for that based on the citywide population, it, it just wasn't there yet. With the new high school coming in and obviously the draw residential to that northwest corner, you know, maybe that'll require a pool in the future, but at the time of the master plan, it wasn't identified as a citywide need yet. 
Okay, thank you. Councillor Jensen. Mr. Chair, thank you. <clears throat> Say, I have a couple of questions as, you know, I'm a big proponent of this um, uh, park and its continued success. I think right now it's really shiny object and it's at the focal point of uh, this meeting and will be for the next several meetings thereafter. But what I don't want to do is forget the ongoing costs that will be affiliated with this park. And I just want to, you know, when we bring this through and discuss it more, I'd like to kind of know your, you know, master plan or your master program for how you're going to maintain the, the structure and the park and who's in charge of, you know, maintenance and um, snow shoveling, mowing the lawn. And I know it, some of that sounds, uh, you know, pretty easy to handle, but um, I want the maintenance and repair of this to be a very big focal point of our parks department, as I know we, we have that. But this will be something that I, and I know there's, you know, many people watching here and here at the meeting that will want to continue to make this a focal point and how we can make it a success as we, so I just encourage you to look at that as we move forward in this process and as we hopefully uh, gain enough support and, and, and pass this through. So thank you for your work. Thank you, uh, you know, the public for coming and making this a priority and uh, raising the funds to, to help make it happen. So thank you guys. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Mike, maybe it was a good question that Councillor Breck did bring up, and we did discuss this a little bit in the past. I mean, in a, you know, in, maybe in a perfect world, you could do a swimming pool. Uh, maybe you could discuss uh, a few of the, there's some logistical challenges with placing something as big as a swimming pool in a neighborhood park when it comes to the, this park is kind of in the middle of a neighborhood, the traffic the parking that would be required, how much of the park you would eat up with supporting uh, infrastructure. So may, maybe talk about maybe the challenges if, if you were, if money was no object in putting a pool, because I'd love a pool, but putting a pool in a park this size. Yeah, so Hayward Park is a neighborhood park and it's meant to serve the neighborhood. Uh, pools would ideally be located in what we call either a a community or a regional park, which is more of a destination for not just the people in the neighborhood, but for really anybody. And the scale of Hayward Park is nowhere near the size, not just from an acreage standpoint, but also just an infrastructure standpoint as far as, yeah, there's not enough parking there. If we were to create a large pool, you'd need a large parking lot. And by the time you'd be done with all that, the entire parkland would be eaten up just by simply the support facilities and the pool itself. And not on top of that, you mentioned that, the, the impact to the neighborhood. And as much as you'd love to have a pool in your neighborhood, you probably wouldn't want one right across the street, just the amount of traffic and noise that comes with, a, with an element like that in a park. So um, if we were to look for where a full-on pool should be located for the Northwest, it would be in one of the community regional parks, either one that we have now or one that we'd identify for in the future. Thank you. I think it was important to point that out because it's something that I, I had thought about as well and kind of as well to Councillor Jensen's point when you want to talk about operating costs, the universe of how much it's going to cost to operate some sort of a spray feature or a park versus a pool with lifeguards is a completely different universe in terms of the load it would put on the city. Now, of course, being represented in the Northwest District, I'd be all for building a new pool in the Northwest District. And, I, and as it grows with the new school, as you, as you point out, I suspect that may come down the road. And we are talking about in the master plan of replacing Keene Park at some point, the pool. Um, I think potentially rebuilding that, maybe even expanding it. Yeah, the, the keen pool is getting near the end of its useful life, so it's something we'll have to address at some point in the future. But you're correct. The operational impact from a pool to a spray pad, is they're not even comparable. Uh, you know, there's extra full-time employees. There's, there's extra maintenance. There's, there's lifeguards. There's, there's so much that goes on with a pool where a spray pad is, is really far less of an impact. It's, it's checking some chlorine levels from time to time and cleaning up and, and regular maintenance. So. So as far as timeline, what would be, if the funding was granted for this, what kind of timeline do you think in terms of design and construct? Well, 
you know, we'd have to we'd have to lay out the plan, but typically I would expect probably about a three month design window with about a six month construction window. So with the goal to impact the park and the school as little as possible, we try and find the right window where that fits. Okay. Very good. Well, I, I will say that this has been something I've been excited about for quite a while. I'm this this is this neighborhood is is uh, um, really near and dear to my heart. It's in my district. I know it well. I've walked it a couple times. My dad actually lives in the in the general area, um, and this is again walking through there. You have and and Steve pointed it out. You have such a lack of of sidewalk and infrastructure with so many mobile homes. You have all of this dog ownership. Um, and then being a lot of it when it's not even not in the mobile home area in the area where like my dad lives and I know Marshall, Councillor Selberg lived, you have kind of a, a rural character. So you don't have sidewalks even in most of the rest of the neighborhood. So literally your only choice is to walk on the road. Um, so, you know, just to have somewhere to go, just go for a walk. And like you said, the connecting facilities to pull the dog park in there, the water feature, um, the water, the, the hydrant parties I know are wildly popular. And as you talked about, it may be a mile and so, but when you think about it, you've got to cross 12th Street, you've got to cross 26th Street, you've got to, you've got to go up a huge hill uh, on Sertoma Avenue. Um, you have multiple impediments to getting to that pool. It would be quite a trek to get there, and especially for children. It's just not a, not a situation that, that you want to have. So i um, very excited. I'm, I'm very grateful to the, to the um, private interests that are looking at helping to uh, help bring equity to this neighborhood. And I think it's something that will be really transformative and really show them and show those kids that, that you're valuable. And uh, th this would be a huge, huge deal. So I hope we can keep the momentum going and uh, put it across the finish line. Thank you very much, and thank you everybody for coming. Really appreciate it. Up next is another really good one, Housing Fund, presented by Jeff Eckhoff, Director of Planning and Development Services, and I believe we have, uh, yeah, Shelley Unruh is here, our housing manager. Good afternoon, Council. Jeff Eckhoff, Planning and Development Services. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you for your time today. I'm going to talk to you about the, the housing fund, the Sioux Falls Housing Fund. There's been a lot of chatter and discussion about this. Uh, a lot of, the, of uh, people saying this is a need we certainly have in our community. So Shelly and her staff, along with myself, have been working on this for several months now, trying to formulate and, and put in place what this fund would look like. So today I'm going to talk about the fund, I'm going to talk about its uses, talk about who could use it, how we envision overseeing it, and, and uh, uh, being a part of that, and probably not as much about the funding source as it, such as it is, uh, probably just generically with that. I will remind you this is in the early stages, so we're here to gather input from all of you on what you like about what you hear today, ideas you have, things you'd like to see us add, and things you'd like to see us um, um, change, perhaps. The challenge with this fund is, well, the challenge that was given to us was to create a fund that's flexible enough, nimble enough, and can help leverage other investment to accelerate the BHAG we have of the 1,000 new affordable housing units. And oftentimes, and, we, and so we currently operate our housing off of federal CDBG and home funds from HUD. And of course, with federal funds, there's certainly uh, regulations. And sometimes it's not the regulations that are the problem as much as the time period. Sometimes you have to go through with different reviews and that type of thing. And one of the things we're finding is that if we want to leverage new investment and work with some of the private developers in town, we need to be more nimble and we need to be more flexible and we need to be able to leverage those funds. And so that's really kind of the charge that we had in this, um, in this uh, standing this fund up. So we created a mission statement about providing flexible funding to leverage public and private uh, investment for the development of accessible housing. And you may remember, uh, for the workforce in the Sioux Falls area, you may remember as Mayor Tenhaken came in, he, he, one of the tenants of One Sioux Falls is accessible housing, which is kind of that workforce housing. So we're looking at leveraging, we're looking at gaps that exist now with trying to get these projects off the ground, and we're looking at the flexibility that we have. So, for example, we traditionally have done a pretty good job and recently an accelerated job 
of working with our nonprofit partners, the Southeast Development Foundation under CCOG with the SNEAV development, uh, as well as uh, uh, habitat development, of course, affordable housing and some of the others that we've worked with, uh, with Lacey Village uh, up in the northeast part of town, where, close to where I live, and then most recently Dove Ridge, which is in the river, Riverside area. So a few definitions of what we're looking at. Of course, we, we, we work around uh, the AMI or area median income that HUD gives us every year. Um, for example, uh, the target in most of the federal programs is 80% or below of AMI. Just as a reminder, for a family four, a, uh, the current 80% is $68,950, just under $69,000 for a family of four. Whereas I like to say mom and dad could each be making six, about 16 bucks an hour and still qualify for this program. So that's the guidelines we're looking at. It's really that spot where the, the rent payment's probably equal to a mortgage payment if they can just get to the mortgage. Uh, like neighborhoods would be if we did a, a affordable housing development altogether in one area where all the homes were, were affordable. In a mixed neighborhood, which is a concept that we've talked to and we're going to talk about, is integrating these homes within other existing neighborhoods of, of uh, beginning starter homes where it's, they're not clustered together. Some of the uses, um, and it's, uh, again, we're working with nonprofit and for-profit uh, developers are eligible to participate in the program, and the costs that are eligible are ac anything that has to do with putting the housing development together. Acquisition, infrastructure, construction, any fees, demolition, uh, financing, any types of costs that have to do with being able to bring those costs down to make it affordable development for our, for our clients. So for example, I had talked about some of our, our earlier pro uh, projects, um, the 24 single family homes in Sneeve, 20 twin home units with a habitat project up in Norton Froelich. Uh, the one at Dove Ridge is actually um, three single family homes and 10 twin homes. And I can't remember the number of units in Lacey Village, but there's 40, 48, yeah, thank you. The thing to remember about our nonprofit partners and kind of the change we went to this year, instead of doing onesies and twosies, we really tried to leverage like 10 or 20 units at a time. So those projects are in motion and they're being built today, but there's an absorption period, right? So we can't just keep going back to CCOG and keep going back to habitat, they need to sell the units they have and then we and move on. So in order to accelerate the rate of, of homes available, we need to work with other partners and we need to bring in, find a way to work with the, with the private developers as well. And that's really what the housing fund is hoping to uh, help uh, spark. Talk about who would we serve. Uh, we would target families at that 80% AMI. That would be where we start. Uh, everybody would be subject to income verification and our, certainly our staff is used to doing those intakes and would continue to do that along the way. Um, but we do have some flexibility on a case-by-case -case basis. What if a person comes in, they had an unexpected windfall or they are at 85% or 82%, I mean, this, but they meet all the qualifications and they're a good candidate for this type of housing. It's something we would look at on a case-by-case -case basis. That's that flexibility that sometimes is needed to make the right choice for the right family. Uh, we would like to have uh, at least one of the adults in the home working in a business in Sioux Falls. That's that connection to workforce. Uh, again, we're providing workforce housing, and therefore we really believe in, in order to be in these homes, they're going to have to ha uh, ha be employed and be able to provide the income. So we want at least one of them working in town to support the workforce um, issues that we have. And all families, of course, will need to provide income verification. In those homes, that they would purchase in the home ownership part of this, whether it's a single family home or whether it's a twin home, we would put a deed restriction on that property that they couldn't sell that for five years to keep the flip, home flippers away from it. That's a similar thing that's done with, the, with our current HUD funds and it just mirrors that, that, uh, that requirement. So we're looking at three segments. We're looking at single family, with, or single family and twin homes, which is home ownership. We'll look at infill development and then we're gonna talk a little bit about multifamily. The single family uh, is probably the most developed. We've actually met with some um, three different builders in town that do affordable or starter homes, if you will, and talk to them about the, this concept and putting this structure together. So again, the goal is home ownership. Um, we'd like to do it, if we're gonna do something with them, we'd want at least 10 units at a time or more. 
Uh, we're not going to do this for one or two units. We, we have programs that do that already. Um, and we can do it, in, here's the term, the like or the mixed use neighborhoods. Uh, we put some uh, dollar amounts to the assistance um, in a traditional HUD subsidized one-off transaction. We tr we're trying to shoot for about $40,000 per home as a subsidy, so we kind of use that as our benchmark in the mixed uh, uh, environment and 30000 in a similar because they're pooling their costs together. And then twin homes are eligible for $20,000 per unit subsidy. And those numbers are debatable. We just threw those, but those are a starting point to talk from. And we've run those paths, uh, again, some of the home builders, they felt those were reasonable numbers and they could make those work to, to leverage that type of uh, development. And then we're targeting the final cost of the owner for a single family home at, at or below around 200,000, which seems a lot, uh, but if you look at the average cost of a starter home, it's, it's in that 230, 240, and so we're looking at that. This is again for new construction and twin homes would be at, at 180. And again, those certainly are numbers that can be discussed and, and, and talked about. We're trying to be obviously accessible and low enough, but we're trying to be realistic too, working with the private builders and what they can build and still make them themselves come out whole as well. Infill, that is probably, as we know, we've talked a lot about neighbor revitalization. We've talked about core neighborhoods. We had a lot of discussion about the needs that those neighborhoods present to us. And so the goal with the fund and, and this, and this is probably one of the areas where we really need some flexibility because we want to be very proactive to what's going on in that neighborhood. We want to be able to take advantage of opportunities. So all of a sudden, let's say there's, there's three or four homes that are all together, they're being torn down or they're all up for sale, they're vacant homes or something. We have the ability to go in there and purchase that. We have the ability to maybe help a developer go in and we can help pay for the demolition or something to assemble those lots and get them rehabbed or torn down and rebuilt. And, and it might be a combination of using the housing fund to, to acquire the lots and using some of the HUD funds to rebuild on that site. That's again, the flexibility of having those funds work together as best that we can. Uh, we would look at older neighborhoods. We look at properties that have uh, a higher number of code enforcement issues. And as you know, and as Shelley has talked to you about, uh, we're looking at more of a proactive property maintenance approach this year. And this certainly fits into that strategy where we could go out spot properties early on and get involved with them as best we can to help keep those properties from deteriorating more by injecting some funds into uh, rehabilitation or doing a revitalization and coming in and, and, and acquiring and building or um, replacing those homes. Again, we'd be looking at home ownerships or single family twin homes within those core neighborhoods. You'll hear us say, and, and, and you'll hear more later this year, we are looking at an increased emphasis as a department on neighborhood revitalization, uh, being more coordinated with our code enforcement. We, that's a little, as those of you who are familiar with that, it can be a little disjointed, and so we're looking at how we can be more coordinated in that, and of course, we're looking at being much more proactive in our property maintenance uh, component um, in order to get ahead of uh, neighborhoods before we have deter too much deterioration. We just kind of scratched the surface on multifamily. Uh, it's kind of, a, um, so the larger tax credit uh, projects that are done in town, it's really hard for us to inject enough money to make a lot of difference there. We always put in a token amount, and really what it does, it helps them with their points on their tax credit application with the city participates. The dollar amount isn't as important as the participation. But we'd like to have the ability in, in some of these projects that maybe are smaller projects or older, uh, smaller units that are trying to rehab or the ability to even try something in mixed rents, which is a concept we've talked about. It's been difficult to implement, and I understand why. Um, but there might be some of these older properties, again, in the older neighborhoods, in the core neighborhoods. As you drive around, there are a lot of these smaller apartment projects tucked around in the city. And if there's an opportunity to, re, to go in there and be involved with them and, and make those affordable units, it's something we want to be able to take a, to take a look at. So the next question would be, how would this fund be administered? How would we manage this fund and how would these decisions be made? And so, um, first of all, the fund, we've had a lot of discussion about it. We, you may remember early discussions talked about a housing trust fund, which, in, which infers an endowment. That's not really what we're looking at. And we talked about using the um, community foundation 
because of the ability for people to, to donate to that fund if they so wanted to. We've decided because of the nature of how the, the funds would exchange, we would make it a, a fund of the city. And certainly uh, donations to the city are tax deductible in the same way that it would be to the foundation. And that way we'd have control within our finance department of that. Uh, we, as you may remember, uh, this body helped us create the new accessible housing advisory board, which was a combination of the county's homeless advisory board and our affordable housing advisory board. We've combined them into one board. Uh, by, by law, uh, there's always a, county, a Minnehaha County Commissioner and a city council member on that board at all times. So that position is always there. Councilor Selber currently fills, fulfills that position. And that board is just getting started. But projects would be run through them for review and approval and recommendation. Uh, if we end up in a development agreement with a, with a builder or something, obviously those agreements all come through city council as well uh, for final approval. And then of course we would uh, provide annual reports to both the council and the public and on our progress and what we're using those funds for. It would be uh, an open fund for that. So um, that is, uh, again, there's a lot of more detail obviously to be filled in, but that's just sort of a high level overview of what we're thinking of doing, how we're thinking of, of providing oversight to that, and how we're hoping to be transparent involvement of both the council and administrative staff and, and our other folks with that. So with that, I, uh, I'm certainly available for any questions. Shelly is here if you have any questions on the, her programs or any additional questions on the advisory board or that type of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the council? Councilor Starr. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director. Um, this is an exciting process of trying to put this together to, to move the needle forward with our workforce housing. One of the things we've seen as a council, and it kind of reared its head here a week ago, is the concept that people who live in uh, accessible housing or multifamily housing are criminals or their dog will do something different on the, the yard. I had one email from a, a person who complained that those people might walk their dog in her neighborhood. And how do we, as part of this program, there's got to be a PR component that goes with it, I guess is what I'm trying to say, to explain so that every time we do a rezone um, that includes accessible housing, that, that that's not there. And I guess more of a, rather than a question, but a statement that somehow we've got to put that PR program together. I know several counselors made that and did a, an excellent job of pointing it out, at least in the, the rezone I'm thinking of. But I think there's something that's got to come from your department that, that helps the community understand that just because you can't afford a two or three or $400,000 house that you're still working full time and you're a hardworking person and you're just trying to raise your family. We just talked about it with the, uh, the Hayward uh, uh, project and, and part of that. So I guess help us help you put something together that, that explains what's going on to the community as we move forward with this type of project. Great point, Councilor Starr. And, you know, hope, the thought with, with changing it to accessible housing and, and talking about workforce housing and tying these, these opportunities to employment, you know, that it's certainly all in an effort to change the conversation. And you're absolutely right. It, it seems it's, it's an automatic reflex if it's multifamily. Uh, forget the fact you know, my daughter just moved to an apartment in Fargo and she's paying 1100 almost $1,200 a month for it, you know, which is more than our mortgage. And so, but yet she's in an apartment, you know, and so there's, there are those perceptions and uh, you're right, it's, it's our job and all of our job to continue to work on that. Thank you. Anyone on the phone? We'll go to Councillor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Neitzer. Um, I liked how you said you had three uh, words that you want this fund to be. I didn't catch the last one, but the first two were great, flexible and nimble. I'd encourage you to really look at this and kind of rethink about the programs that we already have that haven't really moved the needle to where we want to be. And if we do it and we do it successfully, we can really move the needle for workforce housing. The interesting thing, I pulled the numbers on the 9th of January uh, last, year, last year compared to this year. And there are 138 
houses, single family houses on the market right now in the city of Sioux Falls. And last year there were 410 single family houses. So if you think that this problem is going to get any better, I will tell you it's not. Houses in general are going up in, 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 in cost just for the simple demand of them, not to say anything about the lumber that we're using or anything else. The <clears throat> question that I might have for you, when we want to have, you know, let's say $30,000 or $40,000 as a subsidy for new construction, single family, are you putting that in? How is that being implemented into a single family house, just for this example? So that's, that's one of those pieces that we've talked about this. Um, if you give it directly to the builder, my concern is you affect the comps. Right, because now it's a $200,000 sale. And so if we give it to the participant, then you've got to be, obviously you have to have a very binding um, agreement so that we make sure the money goes for the house. And so there's, that is a detail to be worked out. Okay, yeah. But we're aware of the challenges. Gr great point with the uh, comparables, didn't think about that right away. Um, the other thing that I was, you know, just, questioning in general is when you talk about putting a whole neighborhood of one style of house that just kind of raises a red flag in my um, brain but as per your comment you want to you know move all of these houses into all sorts of different neighborhoods where there's houses from 180 in twin homes and and grow them on up as as, as we've seen in many many neighborhoods and like my colleague Councillor Starr said, as you think about this and utilize the land that we have in Sioux Falls that the city owns as well, I think that there might be some utilization of city-owned property to utilize that. Because I think what the builders that I talk to on a daily basis, what their concern is taking down large pieces of land and the holding costs that will um, basically go against their bottom line and ultimately our homeowners bottom line, our workforce housing bottom line, which prices people out of these homes. So that's what I, you know, as you continue to have conversations with these for-profit entities, I think that they're gonna be able to give you a solution that you need to get those housing prices down and more affordable. But I think a lot of it has to do with the holding costs uh, from interest that they're uh, owing to the banks. That's really interesting. So one of the builders that we talked to actually suggested that based on the size of the development, if it's like 15 acres or less, we would expect 10 units. If it's 15 acres or more, they thought they could do 20. And that's with the integrated throughout the development. So the goal is kind of like you drive up and down the street and you don't know which house is really the one that was, we assisted the family to get it, to get into. And so with that, with that said, given the prices that we hopefully be able to bring that price down, they felt there'd be no problem that there'd be a high demand, they'd be able to turn those houses very quickly because of the assistance with the, and what they would do is we would work with their salespeople on, on helping to qualify people that they would send to us for eligibility and, and, and work that through. So one, the cycle gets shorter because they think they can sell those homes fa even faster. Uh, and so, so, so that's a good thing, but it's, it's, it's well taken that we have to work with them to make sure that sales cycle is part of it and there's a lot of factors that go into those carrying costs and we have to make sure we minimize those the best we can and not create more problems for them through bureaucracy and hit delay. Any questions, comments on the phone? Not hearing any, uh, you know, one, one of the challenges that, that we face and you will face is so many people are moving into the community, it kind of feels like you're, you know, using a spoon to shovel out the ocean because you might do four new, four homes or something, but then we have 400 people moving in. So that, and I think you maybe speak to that where you're trying to look to make a dent in things where you have maybe less onesie twosies and more, I mean, how, how do you, how do you even keep up with such a influx? 
Um, you know, yeah, you do, you do feel, <laughs> that's a great analogy, uh, filling in the ocean with a spoon. Some days it's a teaspoon. Um, <laughs> that's tough. You're right, because we have a lot of movement, and, and that just accelerates the demand, which accelerates the whole price and, and, and everything that goes with that. And, um, and then you have lifestyle choices that younger people are making about maintenance-free, love apartments, all that. Um, so it, what we like about this is, yeah, instead of doing ones or twos, we're leveraging 10 and 20 units at a time. The projects that Shelley's office did this past year were 24 or 22 units at a time, and that helps us get gain a little traction. I'll be honest with you, we, it's, it's a combination of new construction, it's a combination of revitalization, it's a combination of going into these, uh, making sure neighborhoods, uh, you're going to hear some uh, tonight from our uh, planning staff on some of the ordinance revisions. You're going to hear a proposed ordinance revision on parking in some of these smaller homes that were built pre-1970s that had just a single star, stall garage. And now we're finding families coming back in to buy those because they're affordable, but now they have weird parking restrictions that are left over from years ago. You're going to see an amendment tonight to change that to allow them to have a little less setback, be able to put up some side path, uh, ex ex expand the width of their driveway so we can get two cars in there. So it's those types of the common sense things that we can help to make the uh, affordable neighborhoods we have, make sure we keep them affordable and accessible to people. It's new construction, it's infill, it's a combination, you know, it's a, it's a thousand different things uh, to get to this result. Uh, as you all know, there's no silver bullet for this by any means. Can, can you remind me of the BHAG of, I think it was a thousand units? Yes, by what? 20... 22. Was there a qualifier on there that those units had to be accessible or at a certain price point, or is it just units, period? It's, I don't remember. Maybe I'll let Shelley answer that. Good afternoon. Shelley Unruh, housing manager uh, with the city of Sioux Falls. Um, when I came into that BHAG, it was my understanding that it was 1,000 units by 2022 and those units were not defined. So it could be accessible units, it could be apartment units, it could be single family units, um, whatever the case may be, but we wanna to help to create those units. Now, coming from the housing division and the way that we've been able to leverage our funding, all of the units that we're being able to affect are units that people can afford that are in that accessible housing range. But I think that has a um, trickle up effect in the fact that if we're helping to create those units, then those units create additional units um, or there's movement which allows other units to be open that are at that accessible housing range. So I think that the work that we're doing um, to create accessible units um, helps to move that momentum upward. And that, that count uh, was for things that we as a city had some sort of tangible effect on. It's not simply a, a private enterprise builds a 300, 300 unit apartment and we get 300, that's not what you're? No, so what we're counting in our BHAG, um, 1,000 units, is something that we, um, the housing division, actually has a participation in. So it's either a project that we've invested in or it's a project in which we have um, helped provide the, the path forward for that development. So maybe it's not, um, investment per se, but it was a letter of support or it was something that really um, helped turn that unit. So in addition, we're also not counting just new construction, but we're also counting units that we've saved because if we're just focusing on new construction, then we're losing the fact that we're losing um, existing units every year due to company expansion, school expansion. Um, there's of accessible houses that are being taken out of neighborhoods all the time. So it's important that we're also um, investing in the rehabilitation and the stabilization of the current accessible housing market that we have. So in that thousand units, it's not only the homes that we create new, but the homes that we're able to save and keep affordable um, by investing in that rehabilitation of that home. Okay, uh, are, you, are you aware of, um Obviously, right now, it's cyclical. We seem to be in a boom period of the, you know, the, there's a lot of apartments, units that will get built, and then there'll be an absorption for two or three years, and then we'll boom again, and we seem to be in the boom cycle right now with these huge projects being announced. Uh, are you aware, I'm not sure if I've, I've seen a lot, if there's any that are either tax credit 
or um, have affordable components to it. I've seen some pretty large, I think, you know, essentially market rate, but are we seeing a lot of... Yeah, so Others there, there the is going to be at least, usually there's at least um, one tax credit project a year that goes forward in Sioux Falls. And so in this yeah. next year, we'll have at least one tax credit project going forward um, that um, Lacey actually is, is one that's in, in process now that we've invested in. And I believe um, Costello might have another one that's going to be going forward um, beginning this year. So, but you're correct in that a lot of the new um, are not, um, through a tax credit application, and they're more at the fair market values. But we have received significant increase in calls um, from outside development investors looking to invest in multifamily, but wanting to do it at affordable rates. When, when, you, when you have mentioned Lacey, are we referring to Six and Bonson Lloyd's project at the next south of the school? Yes. Okay, all right. Yep. Okay, very, very good. Um, and then... Have, have you done, uh, I guess, maybe looked in other jurisdictions that the model of, of essentially doing something where you subsidize, you know, like we might put 40,000 in, I mean, does that scale and does that, does that work, you know, to bring that you get to the goal that you want to in terms of, you know, getting a house to an accessible, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it sounds great. I'll, obviously, any, anything with accessible housing sounds great, but, you know, what we need to figure out what programs will scale and will work and actually move the needle. So, because we've done, we do some of that, you know, where we have a silent second and it sounds like we're maybe talking about doing that, but on a larger scale, potentially. Are you referring to the housing fund or I'm not sure what you're asking? Well, like, so for example, the one where we're talking about where we would put in something where we would, you know, help the builder get the cost down to an affordable level. So maybe we put in $40,000 or something like that. And then there's some sort of, you got to stay there five years or whatever. Um, that, I mean, have we seen this in other communities? Do they, I mean, is this work to success? Because we've done, we've done some of that. And I don't know, but I don't know whether or not we have measurables to know that, you know, it, it actually works, I guess. So, Sure. So there are other housing funds in, in many, many other communities um, where they ledge bridge it in different ways. To be honest, I, I don't know of a community that I could reference on hand um, that is similar to the programmatic changes that we've made in the housing division over the last year, um, but definitely something that I can look into. But what really I think the housing division saw as an opportunity is that we do get um, a good investment of CDBG and home funds. And we're, we're investing those in um, construction anyway through our neighborhood revitalization program. So how can we reimagine those funds um, to escalate them to a bigger scale to meet the need? And so that's really what we um, have been focused on and, and really working hard with HUD to make sure not only are we creating the units, but we're also doing it um, within the federal guidelines of the funding source. And so far we've been able to do that um, pretty successfully but haven't really heard of um, parallel communities um, that have been doing similar work that we have. I'm sure that they're out there. We just um, saw, saw an opportunity and, and we just moved forward with it. Okay, and then there's, there's very few new ideas. Many, of, many are ideas that are taken from somewhere else and stolen. And have we looked at other communities in terms of if there's any wildly successful programs or maybe it depends very much on the particular, you know, cities, you know, in terms of what programs work, the things we haven't tried before, you know, things like that. So, and I know we're already looking at some of that, but. Sure. Well, I would say the housing fund is, is one, one where we really have done um, some investigation into other communities to see what they're leveraged for, how, how are they using those funds um, to, for development, and then what are the sources that's creating those funds and, and how are they long-term sustainable. So that is definitely some work where we've done um, some research to kind of help develop some of the framework um, for the original plan of the housing fund and then vetted that through our um, local development community to see if what has worked in other communities for similar ways in which we would invest in their development project would work for them. So I would say the core of um, what's Jeff presented in the proposal comes from collaborative um, research across um, like-sized communities on how they're utilizing their funds. Okay, and 
many programs that have like a, where, where there's some sort of component to it where you get some sort of a silent second or something, they'll make you go through like a home ownership class or, or financial literacy, things like that, so that to lower the risk of default. Uh, have we, and I don't know what, what we necessarily do now in terms of, um, you know, like, so like for something like this, for the end user, for the homeowners, would there be anything tied into the, that we've thought about or not? Well, I th certainly think that that's something that we can take a look at in consideration. Mom, part of what spurs um, folks to take a first time home buyers or mortgage um, type of class is the funding source that they're using to purchase that home is oftentimes what gets somebody into those classes. So I think that that's definitely an opportunity and thankfully we have great partners in the community that we could lean to for that. But we still need to figure out, I think as the director pointed out, does the money go to the builder? Does the money end up as a money to the, and I don't know how that affects somebody if they're going to have money on the table from a third party, you know, like when you go to closing, sometimes that can mess things up unless there's, it's very well that this is a gift, it's not a hidden loan and all that, you know, all that, that sort of stuff. So um, I don't think it's very high, but do, uh, for the projects that we have, we don't have a very high default rate, do we, where we go into, where we have people that we've put into these homes that go into foreclosure? I mean, it happens, but is it? Pretty. It happens, but I'm not aware of a high default rate. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, okay. I think that's all the questions I had. Um, it's an ex exciting, exciting deal. It's going to be, um, it's a challenge, though, because we have thousands of people moving to the city, and it's just getting even faster. So uh, wish you luck. Thank you. I'll see. It sounds like the director might want to you know, close up. comment is that yeah. in the, I can't remember the date, we're going to be bringing the discretionary formula revisions to you, and one of those is for commercial for housing, for affordable housing. So that will be another tool on the multifamily uh, part that we hope to bring forward. Yes, Councillor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Say, Director, one more question for you. You were talking about this, and you don't, I hope, have the answer, but if you do, really great if you did. Um, when we're talking about regulations that are going to be impacting accessible land for housing, um, with the floodplain change that we're contemplating, I would like to know personally uh, what moving from, I think, one foot to three foot, and we, two to three, um, how many acres of developable land that's going to take off the, the city's uh, ability to build on that. Because I think some of those areas could potentially be developable. Um, and going from two to three, that's a big leap. Mm -hmm. So I just would like to know that when making that decision. Because you, like you said, as we move regulations around, this is one that could impact our ability to do that. Point well taken. We'll, we'll have that number for you when we come back. Thank you. And maybe in closing, to, to um, reiterate what Councillor Jensen had said, in, in my discussion with builders and developers, they, they largely are going to have a lot of the answers in terms of what's their highest risk and what are costing them money and what's the impediments. I mean, they will tell you there's certain things like the carrying costs, like if they have a home sit on the market for a couple months, it can easily chew up the little bit of profit margin they have. And so it's really difficult sometimes to do some of the, the lower priced homes where you don't have a whole lot of margin anyway and you lose that little bit just from the carrying cost of paying the interest on that, you know, on that loan or whatever. So, um, you know, what, what impediments do they have? So. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. It, it, I think it would surprise most people to know how thin those margins can be on, on those developments for the, the builders and the risk that's associated with that. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thanks Thank for coming. You. With that, we are going to go to public input. Anyone who would like to speak on any item that was on the agenda today, welcome. Scott Arisman, Sioux Falls. <clears throat> I was chuckling a little bit earlier in the meeting when uh, uh, Kurt Sale asked, you know, why is it costing a million dollars for concrete and pipes? And Kurt, I, I, I have the answer to that. Every time the city builds something, it costs two to three times more than what the rest of us normally pay for it. Um, we've seen that with all kinds of things, bunker ramp, uh, event center, 
I could go on and on, administration building. It always seems like every time the city builds something, it's just two to three times more. That's just kind of how it is. I don't know if that's a deal with the contractors or what it is. Um, I've been concerned about it for a long time, but no one seems to want to do competitive bidding and comparative bidding to see why the city pays so much more for something than, than the normal public. As for this housing thing, I'm glad we're moving in some different directions with it, <clears throat> but I've been at this for a while. Our core of our city is in bad shape. And I've said, told counselors over the years, the best way to put a perspective on this is get on a bike or, or walk during the summer through the core neighborhoods. And like what you'll see is you'll go down one block and it looks pretty good. The houses look good, the street looks good. You'll take a corner and these houses don't look so good. We need to invest in the people of this town. Building $200,000 homes, a handful of them a year, that's not going to solve our affordable housing problem. You need to do a large-scale project. And my idea has always been to give TIFs. You give property tax rebates to people who fix up their houses. Windows, roofs, siding. And then you go into those neighborhoods, that the people who are willing to take those TIFs, and you clean up the curb and gutter, and you clean up the lighting, and you fix the streets. There are streets in the core neighborhood that actually have grass growing in, in them. Grass. Don't believe me, go drive around and look. We are neglecting our core neighborhood. We are neglecting the people who live here or already own homes or apartment buildings and want to fix stuff up. We're taking this huge chunk of money, and we're building a couple of houses a year for it. You're going to solve the affordable housing problem with that. You're going to solve the problem by doing these small rebates for people, hundreds and hundreds of them a year. And you'll clean up the neighborhoods and you'll actually invest back in the community. And guess what? It's a property tax rebate. So it doesn't cost us anything. I mean, that's what we're always told when we give tips to the millionaire developers in town. This isn't costing us anything. So what is it any different for a small homeowner? Let's say Bob pays $1,200 a year in, in property taxes, and instead we give that money back to him to fix his roof. This is how you do it. It's not stupid. I proposed this idea to Kenny Anderson 10 years ago. He goes, it's fantastic. He went to the planning department, and he was told to go to hell. I mean, I don't understand why we can't wrap our heads around this. We give massive tax rebates and tax incentives to the big guys in town. Millions, of, and we covered it up for, what, 10 years? We didn't even know we were giving these rebates? Millions and millions and millions of dollars in rebates. But we can't give Bob $1,200 to fix his roof, clean up our neighborhoods, clean up our core? Come on. And, and it's not rocket science. Other cities have done this. You can, you can go study it. Hundreds of cities across the, the country have done these, things, these projects this way. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. And lastly, before I'm done, since I got a little time left, I've been noticing, and I knew this was going to happen when we moved the council meeting to 6 o'clock. We don't have enough time to ask questions. We don't have enough time to do, you know, to do the, the presentations properly. And you were warned of this. The reason why you had the meeting at 7 o'clock is so people could attend it after they got home from work and had time to get there. And that and that you had plenty of time between the informational and the council meeting to get your business done. And almost every single meeting, not everyone, this is an exception, almost every single informational meeting has been budding right up against the council meeting. Because you moved it. And there was no real reason you needed to move it. Somebody just wants to get home earlier. And as I've testified over the years, there is no time limits on meetings. There is nothing in the charter that says a meeting can only last a certain amount of time. Nothing. Show me. Move the meeting back to 7 o'clock. Thank you. Others with public input? Seeing none, our executive session has been canceled, so this meeting is adjourned.